Consider the dandelion, a humble plant without pretension and a valued, tenacious, grows on the highways and byways, carried by the wind, so leaps all barriers and frontiers. The color of sunlight, it brings heart and comfort to sad places. The roots are deep, it is uncontainable, far-reaching and free. This beautiful poem by Gillian Keane introduces the story of my long and convoluted journey that took me from a country house in Devon over several years to Bosnia and Croatia. And it's an example of what's happened all my life, that chance encounters have led me to my next unexpected project. I've always had a difficulty to plan, never had an idea of where my career might go, or even that it was a career. It was just something that I did. And Gillian was the person who told me that throughout your life you are getting messages and what you have to do is obey them when you are called. I was first introduced to the prime movers and shakers behind the Dandelion Trust at an informal dinner during my early days as director of the fourth year performing project at London Contemporary Dance. The Trust had just taken ownership of a small theatre in Spilsby, a market town in Lincolnshire, and by the end of the evening I found myself agreeing to not only lead a workshop there, but also to arrange for my 4D students to visit Spildby as part of our upcoming national tour. More than that, Gillian, Annabelle, Jane and Janie, trustees of the Dandelion Trust, had intrigued me with their description of its wide-reaching mission. The Trust was not easily defined, and certainly not to be defined by any single project. To the contrary, it consisted of a group of dedicated individuals committed to any activities and ideas that encouraged peace, tolerance and understanding. Whether promoting the arts, challenging attitudes that created division or simply being friends to those in need, the members devoted their thoughts and energy only towards positive life enhancement. The taking on of Spilsby Theatre, for example, was far more reaching, far, uh, was more far-reaching than building uh, preservation. It is an attempt to save and develop an important and cultural resource. Promoting the activities of, activities of the theatre was only a part of the reason for inviting me. They wanted to involve local children in a dance activity for its own sake. Their dedication to peace and the realisation of the role the arts can play to that end spoke to me. I wanted to be part of it. A non-religious person like myself also desires a spiritual home, and I felt a hand being extended. I was drawn into its loose but embracing structure, its lack of religious affiliation and dogma, and the trustees' tenacity and commitment. Along with the many other individuals worldwide from all walks of life, I wanted to become a friend and supporter. Later, along with many others, I made a contribution towards the purchase of a large house and surrounding land in Devon. Hazelwood House, with its open fires, 14 bedrooms, large kitchens, stables and cottages, perched precariously on the steep slopes of a peaceful, uncultivated valley. Its veranda was the ideal place to gather in the spring sunshine, to gaze upon pastures that sloped gently down to a clear rushing river <coughs> before rising steeply on the other side into dense deciduous forest. It was a place where the living could learn to die and the dying could learn to live. Many people came there for recuperation and rest or to end their days in tranquility and peace. Over the years, I too benefited from this peaceful place nourished by home-cooked organic meals, long rambles, workshops in the converted chapel studio, or just conversing with like-minded individuals from all over the globe. I passed evenings in the chapel enjoying dance and theatre by Zulus, Bulgarians, travelling British companies and solo artists. The large open sitting room in the main house afforded the indigenous people of Colombia's mountain communities uh, and I afforded an opportunity to relax to the sounds of an Indian raga, 
to be inspired by a talk on the indigenous peoples of Colombia's mountain communities or on life in the remote villages of Kurdistan. Some of the people I met there over dinner or while sitting under the great oak tree that kept vigil before the house will be known only to a small circle of friends. Others are famous figures from the world of theatre or show business, singers, storytellers, composers, choreographers. I even found myself in discussion with politicians, members of the World Bank and refugees, fugitives from torture. The Dandelion Trust served as an inspiration to new engagement. Encouraged by these experiences and my friends at the Trust, I began to see myself as a member of the world community, with the potential of taking my skills and experience to new uncharted territory. Hazelwood was to become the springboard to Sarajevo. It all began with a visit to Devon by a group of adults with learning difficulties part of a community from a sheltered Caritas workshop in Germany. No sooner had they arrived than their joyful, rambunctious presence um, uh, made itself felt. Then we heard that a group of traumatised children from the Balkans were stuck in London seeking a place to rest and recuperate. The dandelions quickly agreed to take them in as well. Between their dance workshops in the chapel, our German friends were enjoying long walks on the Devon Moors, evenings in village pubs, <coughs> and trips to local beauty spots. Uninhibited, they danced through the house at Hazelwood, giving impromptu performances in the kitchen, on the veranda, and in the stairwells. When the group of children from mixed communities of former Yugoslavia arrived a couple of laters, days later, they were a sad lot indeed. Wary and mistrustful, they clung together in small groups and resisted contact. We adults, respecting their need for privacy, held back, but our learning difficulty guests did not. Without hesitation, they engaged the newcomers by pulling them into their dances and games, and slowly but surely we witnessed a miracle. Overwhelmed by the attention of the older Germans, the children began to emerge from their isolation. During our final party at the end of a fun and activity-packed fortnight, it was a delight to see everyone dancing together, hugging and laughing, a clear demonstration of the barrier-breaking potential of dance. And this example also led me later on to start working with uh, young people uh, with learning difficulties together with traumatised people. The time came for the Germans to leave. After tearful farewells, those of us remaining in the house were diminished by their absence, but enlightened by their influence. Before the Bosnian children departed a few days later, they invited us to visit an exhibition of paintings depicting their experiences and emotions during the conflict that had engulfed their communities. It was to be held in the small Croatian town of Samovor. Simultaneously, a crest arrived at Hazelwood, asking for the Dandelion women to attend a Through Heart to Peace meeting in the same town. The initiative came from a fledgling Balkan organisation called Women of the World. As I had already decided to attend the exhibition, I decided to accompany the Dandelions on their conference. Gillian took the precaution of informing her contacts who were pleased to accept me as an honorary woman of the world. A week later, I set off in my trusty Mercedes van. At the southern Austrian town of Klagenfurt, I rejected the tunnel and chose instead the slow and steeply graded approach to the mountainous border to Slovenia. I crossed in darkness and parked my bus for the night. When I awoke, it was still misty, but as I descended the winding roads, the magnificent landscape of mountain and forest fell away to Slovenian farmlands. I took my time, rested early in the evenings at an empty camping place, where I succumbed to the stillness and whisperings of the pine trees, filling my lungs with pure country air. By evening, I was in Ljubljana, a gentle city cut through by a rushing river the old and new towns connected by the famous Triple Bridge. After taking a couple of rooms and a cheap pension, I waited. Arrangements had been made in Devon 
that I would stand on the bridge every hour, on the hour, until my Hazelwood friends arrived. We celebrated our meeting up with a meal and long conversation and retired early, each going to bed with their own thoughts on what the next day would bring. A civil war was raging in the Balkans, and for all we knew, the remainder of our journey could be dangerous. People were dying, but as one wise friend among us said, people are also living, and they are the people we're going to see. It was a beautiful sunny morning as we drove in convoy two hours south to Ljubljana. The countryside was green and peaceful, Hay was drying on wooden racks in the fields, and the thinly populated, traditionally farmed landscape was carpeted with wildflowers. War seemed far away. Annie, my new companion, and I chatted of this and that as we chugged south. At the Croatian border, however, there was an air of tension, and only after a thorough questioning regarding our business and inspection of the bus, a business and inspection of the bus, were we allowed to continue to the border town of Samovor, where the late Marshal Tito, head of the rapidly disintegrating Yugoslavia, had once lived. Despite being mid-morning on a Saturday, Samovor, Samovor was sleepy, but we were soon able to locate the school where our children and women of the world were waiting. The meeting had been convened by an elderly Croatian and a young Bosnian who envisioned that women would be the key to ending the conflict. Many of the 30 or so women attendees were local and my Dandelion Trust friends were to represent the international component of this, the first Woman of the World conference. As an honorary Woman of the World, surrounded by some of the delighted kids, I was happy to be standing there. The kids proudly showed us their paintings, vibrant but disturbing reminders of childhood wartime trauma, picturing trees, sunflowers, brightly coloured birds and white fluffy clouds in a clear blue sky, mingled with airplanes spitting bombs, tanks, guns and stick men lying in pools of blood. Afterwards we sat down with the women for our initial meeting. The first and major topic was the absence of Serbian women, which led to a passionate and heated discussion about the Chetniks, the Serbian citizens of Croatia and Bosnia, who had recently declared war on their neighbours. Wounds were raw, and although people acknowledged that not all Serbs were responsible for the atrocities that were taking place, it was nevertheless felt that Serbian expansionist, expansionist ambition was the main reason the war was happening. Mutual distrust had led to a near total breakdown in communication. The meeting calmed down as we listened to their concerns, and those of us who were outsiders realised our main role was to bear witness. In time, we would discover the situation was far more complex than reported in the foreign press, and that old enmities involving past oppression on both the Croatian and Serbian side had led to the current breakdown. Without the powerful restraining influence of the late Marshal Tito, the confederation known as Yugoslavia, comprised primarily of Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia and Serbia, was dis disintegrating under the weight of demands for independence by each member state. No concrete plans were formulated for the future, um, future direction of this embryonic movement of women. But this weekend of orientation and social activity enabled the members to get to know each other and helped us as outsiders to better understand the bigger picture. When the meeting ended, Dunya, a lone guitarist with a voice that could roar like a cannon and ring like a Turk church bell, restored harmony by singing old Croatian and Russian love songs.